I'm going to talk about buying a dental practice and why it's something that I really think you should consider. We're going to go into why so many dental practice owners are successful so quickly, how fast wealth growth can happen, what are some key things that you need to be aware of and sensitive to if you are going to buy a practice or start a practice. And I'm going to discuss too just some of the secrets that I've seen working with thousands of dentists that have you know really helped them just grow like a rocket ship in terms of their success as practice owners and why after you see some of the things I'm going to show you in this video, I think you're going to get really excited and want to either expand something you've already got or get involved with ownership if you're not already. So let's jump in. So when we're thinking about buying a dental practice, you know, the first thing I want to point out is just how it all works. Like why are owners better off financially than employees usually? So the, the big gist of it is employees, they get 25 to 35% of the revenues that they're producing. Now, this is usually kind of how it works out too in terms of the back end, you know, you know, math on the napkin, so to speak. I mean, that's just generally what I see happen. Now, owners tend to get 40 to 60% of revenues, depending on what part of the country you're in, depending on how high your overhead is, et cetera. And so if you think about it, you know, taking that entrepreneurial risk of being the person who's in charge does reward people quite a lot. It kind of makes sense, right? So employees, you know, do get a lower share of the revenue they're producing. Now, you might have a minimum daily guarantee. You might have some things as an employee that you might think, oh, I don't know if I quite get a percent of, of revenues. Everybody gets a percent of revenues. The only question is just how is it calculated, right? If it's a flat salary, it kind of works out to being 25 to 35 percent usually. If it's a, um, you know, I mean, sometimes it's more, you know, very clear, right? You get a minimum or you know, that 25 to 35%, whichever is greater. The point is, is that, you know, there's got to be enough money in it for whoever is operating the practice to want to do that. Otherwise, they're not going to want to do that, right? So becoming an owner is essentially you're capturing a significantly higher share of the money you're producing. And if you are, you know, if you are trying to um, buy practice or start a practice, what's going to happen is a bank that's going to give you a loan is going to look at that extra revenue that they're expecting you're going to capture as an owner they're going to make sure that they can get paid back. So in terms of, you know, what, what is owning your own practice in a world where there's DSOs and, you know, just giant corporate options, and it's just very intimidating for some people to own a dental practice. So think about it like craft beer, right? You've got your big corporate options, right? Your Natty Light, your Bud Light, your, you know, Michelob Light, right? And people use them. It's, a, you know, a lot of people think it's a decent option, but then a lot of people really like to, spend a lot of money on really good, you know, local craft beer. Well, why is that the case, right? People want to have that human touch. They want to feel something unique, something interesting, something special. That's never going to go away. And corporate, that's why corporate dentistry is never going to completely vanquish the solo practice owner doc, right? Or the two or three doc practice. It's because people, you know, can tell a difference, I think, in a lot of cases between a corporate owned practice and a, you know, mom and pop owned practice in the community. And there's going to be a segment of the market that's always going to want to pay more, frankly, to get that personal, you know, doctor owner experience uh, instead of having, you know, again, just sort of feeling like another number in the machine, right? So the idea here is if you're going to own your own practice, you should be confident that there's a lot of people out there that want what you'd be able to provide and would not necessarily want to go to corporate, even if it's cheaper. Now, the success rate of practice owners in dentistry, you will be shocked. So the success rates that I've seen personally and I've heard from other practice bankers is something like 99% is the success rate. That's insane. So think about like pizza shops, maybe one in five of those are still going after five years. In contrast, you know, the vast majority, 99 out of 100 or so, dental practice loans get repaid. And it's just because dental practices are very, very, very low risk compared to other things. People have to have dentistry done in a lot of cases, right? If somebody's got an extreme painful, you know, problem in their mouth, like, you know, you might not be able to do anything except get that treated. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes people might, you know, push out dental care, but what does that often happen? What often happens when people push out dental care? A lot of times the results much worse than if they've just gotten preventative care, right? So it's something that people have to get in contrast to some other things, maybe say like, you know, veterinary medicine that people are not obligated to purchase, right? So, you know, this, this is really what's driving a lot of the success rate. It's sort of like, is there a need? And then if there's a need, then whoever supplies it will get, you know, a certain amount of compensation for supplying the need, right? Now, you know, because the success rate is so high, a lot of people underestimate how, how high the success rate is. This is one of the reasons that practice owner dentists grow their wealth so quickly. 
So, I mean, you know, I've seen cases where people will do a startup and in a few years they're earning $2 million a year. And it's not every case, right? But the, the point is, is that because that success rate is so high, you know, a lot of people look to crypto or they look to real estate to make extra money or they look to the stock market. But all those things have tons of competition. If, you know, anybody can purchase those. But dental practices, not everybody can operate those. In some states, there's even protections against non-dental you know, entities buying uh, practices, right? So you've got something very unique and special that you can operate as a dentist. And so because that success rate is so high, because it all, usually always works out, it's kind of like a forced savings mechanism where you're earning more money, you're capturing more of your revenues that you're producing, and that's getting reinvested into a practice that you eventually own and can sell and make money on. So, you know, it, I would say that, you know, one of the fastest ways to grow wealth as a dentist, regardless of whether or not you have student loans, is to part purchase a practice. Now, what happens when you grow wealth faster than everybody else is you've got more options in life, you have more choices. So now I'm going to show you a spreadsheet to kind of put some more numbers to this. So uh, looking at these numbers, let's just say you've got somebody who's an associate making 180000 a year. Let's say they're doing the pay plan, got a couple hundred thousand of loans. The big thing that I want to draw your attention to here is let's just pretend that this person is putting aside maybe 4% of their paycheck to their 401k and getting a match. So this person is putting in a very modest amount into retirement. And if they put a modest amount of money into retirement, then they're going to be growing you know, fairly slowly with their wealth growth, right? So you can see how their assets grow over time. And then you can see net worth with that $200,000 of student loans. And this is income from investments. So when you have enough money coming off of these investments to be able to retire, that's when you're financially free. So if we pretend for a moment this dentist needs 150 grand a year to live off of, then the first year that you surpass that 150 grand is down here when you're at about 3.7 million of assets in total. And so that's almost 40 years away. That's quite a lot there. So we're seeing, you know, just a really long period of time before somebody could stop working as an associate if you're just saving, you know, a modest amount of, of your paycheck, like 4% or so. Now, if you do a little bit better job of saving, uh, let's say you put aside the maximum in your 401k, 23k a year or so, and then you put in extra money into, let's say, a mortgage or a brokerage account, something like that then you're able to hit that 3.7 million net worth that I'm just sort of making up here as a number that you need to retire um, with 150K of passive income need. That happens now in 30 years instead of 39. So what really happens that's like when your wealth growth goes like gangbusters is if you buy a successful practice, let's just say for a moment that you buy it for a million dollars. So for that million dollar practice, let's say you do it with a 10 year term in your loan. So you are growing your wealth by 100,000 a year in that case because you're earning higher amounts of um, you know, revenues, higher percentage of your revenues that you're producing, and it's getting reinvested and paying down the practice loan that is growing your wealth, right? And so what happens is instead of 30K a year of wealth growth, I'm gonna completely redo this. Forget the savings rate as a percentage, it won't make sense. Basically what you need to just focus on is just what does the wealth growth look like over here? So if I bump this number up to about like 130,000, again, just don't worry about that percentage there. What matters is your wealth, your income would be going way up and then you're capturing more of that income with this practice loan that you're paying down. So if you go from 30K to 130K of wealth growth by being a practice owner, your financial independence state goes from 30 years if you're doing a decent job saving as an associate, all the way down to 15. So that's truly insane. And if you think about you know doing a startup, you can have even greater success in that situation one of the things I like to talk to people about is, you know, what is the worst case scenario that can happen if you start a dental practice? Probably what would happen is, is it doesn't go that well. You earn less money than you would as an associate. And, you know, you have to work two or three years to get to a point where you feel like the practice is at a break even. And then you sell the practice and you break even uh, or take some amount of loss from your invested money. And you move on and just go back to being an associate again, right? In a really bad scenario that you where you'd had to declare bankruptcy, which very rarely happens with dentists, then maybe you'd have to wait around for seven years before you'd be able to take another stab at it, at being a practice owner. So the, the, the downsides are very defined and limited, and the upsides are truly huge. Now, the, you know, there are some scenarios where you would not want to buy a practice, like if you're going to be in a certain part of, uh, you know, the country very temporarily, you know, if you don't know where you're going to end up, if you have a significant other that's going to have to move. Uh, very soon from two different location for work. There's some great reasons to not be a practice owner. You know, also maybe if you're focused on, you know, maybe you want to grow your family or, you know, have flexible hours or something like that. And they just practice ownership is not 
something that you want to do right now, but maybe it's something you want to do later. All those things are really reasonable, but you shouldn't be afraid of it. You shouldn't be afraid of being a practice owner and really fulfilling your potential if that's something that you want to do, because the numbers are absolutely ginormous. So just remember, I'll show you this chart one more time. You can be whatever you want to be in dentistry, but at the end of the day, if you're going to be capturing so much higher percentage of the revenues, that's going to result if you just simply are a pleasant person talking to your patients, they're going to accept treatment plans. It's going to work out. You'll be able to hire professionals like CPAs and practice consultants for anything that you don't know how to do. And it's going to give you more options in life. So that's the real best reason to become a practice owner is to have choices. Who doesn't like choices? And if you need more encouragement, follow Student Loan Planner for more videos like this. And then put in the comments whatever your fears or successes have been as a practice owner you know, in dentistry. We want to hear what 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 are your what is your what's on your mind about being a practice owner or your fears about being a practice owner. We'd love to hear that in the comments. Thank you for following Student Loan Planner. And again, I hope you follow us for more content like this.